the big art of, of being on stage is that you are not going to the audience, but you're actually <laughs> taking the audience to you. I'm Jukka Pekka Saraste and this is Living the Classical Life. Mr. Sarasri, thank you so much for being on the show. It's pleasure. a pleasure to have you here. So you started out your career as a violinist. I started the violin in the conservatory of, uh, of Lahti. And um, it's an interesting place because the whole uh, conservatory was brought from Bibok, um, where all these Russian uh, immigrants were, were teaching. And, and, and when after the war, the whole institution came to came to then my hometown Lahti, and and there was a very intense um, kind of director <laughs> wanted new people to start start violin and, and and string instruments, and I was I was the kind of victim <laughs> at that time. <laughs> so I started violin, and then soon they uh, kind of included me in the in the orchestra of young young people's orchestra and i i was playing as a concertmaster and uh, then the conductor sometimes said that would you like to try conducting uh, this orchestra and then and of course yeah and then it felt like okay this is very interesting and about i was about like eight or nine years old that time and then at the age of 12 uh, he allowed me to conduct more and more that orchestra. Then, then I even got my own orchestra uh, when I was kind of uh, in early teens. So it it kind of gradually became something uh, something real. So you had an orchestra from from an early age, where you had exposure to it as a as a young child. Do you think that it takes a certain personality type to stand in front of an orchestra and to lead it? Or I'm trying to get a sense of is there a such thing as a shy conductor? Yeah, I know very many, many shy people, but they have this incredible musical conviction, which I think, after all, is the most important thing for any any conductor, that you have to believe in, in, in what you are doing, and you have to have this kind of uh, inner strength um, to, to demand, because there is one vision that is yours, and you, you, you believe. I think that without that vision um, or wish or strength, will, uh, there's no, no point in becoming a conductor. It's of course one thing to be a music director uh, in, in different places across a, a long period of time. 
But then there's also traveling around and being a guest conductor. I'm trying to get a sense of how long it takes to arrive to a location. Is it that you have a preconceived sound that you're looking to draw from the orchestra, or you are waiting to assess what you hear from this ensemble, especially if you've never met them, and then you adjust accordingly based on their ability. I mean, it probably takes a lot to draw and achieve your ideal sound, if that's what you're looking for. It's not always a compromise, but then you have to enjoy <laughs> what they are giving, what is their kind of uh, vision of the sound and what is their style. You can't change in, in three or four days uh, so many things, but I think the the ability to uh, kind of give and take uh, from from the situation is, I think, uh, very essential. Uh, although I think that uh, if you have a firm relationship to a good orchestra, like your own orchestra, then uh, you can develop a musical language uh, style uh, that you de then probably can better introduce to the others. But I think you have to learn it with your orchestra uh, to be able to, to convey that kind of idea to the others. Let's say you're, you're preparing a, a large work like Mother Ninth Symphony. Mm. I mean, if you're thinking of three days of rehearsal, there's almost no time to go through many specifics other than just running through the material. In the older world, in the days of Toscanini, before all the, the unions, really rehearsals could drag on and on many days. We don't have that luxury these days, but mm. How do you structure a short period of rehearsal like that? Well, first of all, I think that uh, it's a very good example is Marlin 9, because uh, I, when I started with the Finnish Radio Orchestra and did that for the first time, I told the management that this is a piece I want to do every second year yeah. to kind of develop the idea of, the, of that piece, because in the first first time it's, it's, it's nothing. <laughs> you need six or eight performances before you are really comfortable with with that piece. Partly because uh, uh, Mahler Ninth Symphony is not as as uh, precisely kind of written because he never could, could do that himself. If you've had this opportunity to play with the same orchestra every other year, what was the idea behind that? And was there an opportunity perhaps for yourself to become aware of some type of growth that was there a moment where you became aware that you have been growing artistically? Yeah, that is, that is exactly what happened. And I was very kind of thankful for, for, the, for the orchestra that they allowed me to do that so often. I'm very fascinated by some descriptions of your conducting as being clear and objective, but I also know that you are particularly aligned with romantic repertoire. And I thought initially, could that be a contradiction? Well. I could, I buy the term of objective uh, thing, but but for me it means uh, a line and, and and direction in music. So I I strongly believe that uh, that uh, like Tchaikovsky, for instance, if you let it kind of be totally free and and kind of indulge uh, every every nanosecond of it, it becomes, uh, it, it is not right for me to, 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 to think that way. And actually I started with Tchaikovsky very late, only after I heard the Ravinsky recordings. And then I, I thought that, okay, now I kind of understand. Let's say it's objectivity, but it's, it can be also that there is a name all the time to go somewhere. And, 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 and this kind of musical line is, is to, for me, is very, very important, even in the romantic music. And, and that's why I kind of also very late, I started with the Brahms, Brahms symphonies, because I, I tried them when I was younger and it never felt, felt right because I couldn't somehow combine this, uh, pulling and pushing of, of Brahms in, 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 a, in the sound and the style. I, I, I've, either I felt it too lightweight or then I felt it too heavy. So you have to have this kind of friction in, in between these two, 
two things. And that then, then I started doing the symphonies quite late, but then I realized that maybe I kind of found something and, and then through the process of, of thinking more. Um, kind of my, my way of doing it and, and it just happened very late. <laughs> how much can you as a conductor uh, decide how much to give of yourself? If it's an emotionally impactful performance, are you yourself emotional? I'm, I'm fascinated by this, this concept. I had a discussion with a young, young musician and young soloist once and, and uh, he asked that what do you think? I'm, am I doing too much for the audience? And I said, yeah, I think so. And I think the, bi the big art of, of being on stage is that you are not going to the audience, but you're actually <laughs> taking the audience to you. And, and the, the strength to do that is not very easy to, to, to find. But uh, I can only... <laughs> think of some incredible performances that I've been playing, like, uh, let's say, Radu Lupu, for instance. He comes and he puts his hand to the piano, and there's not one person that's not, not totally fascinated about, about what comes out. And then there are many pianists that, that need this kind of overwhelming uh, effort to, to, to do it. And um, I think there, the real art is really to bring the bring the people to your fingers, and that's that's of course in conducting it. It is not the audience; it's the orchestra that you want to capture at the beginning. And when you have this kind of uh, link to the performance, which is the orchestra, then you can actually together make whatever you kind of feel like. But you have to have this this uh, communication line going on. Well, that's fascinating because I'm thinking about how Carlos Kleiber didn't always show specific beats and gestures, and he left that uh, for the orchestra to fill in the blanks. And maybe that also applies to the the audience. Mm -hmm. If if we really underline a super specific interpretation, we don't we don't uh, allow them the space to meet us halfway. Mm -hmm. I had a very good uh, advice from um, from my teachers and professors. Uh, that uh, uh, in order to, let's say, have a goal somewhere, you have to sometimes let it go. And then when the goal comes, to you, you, then you hit. But you have so much more resources to do if you don't fuss around all the time before you really have something to show. And, and that is, that is uh, kind of a big... A uh, long road to go, of course, for conductors. That it, uh, many conductors, it seems that they they think that they have to play the instrument, like they have to play every every instrument, and then later they realize that the, actually the players are playing, and then you have to just to um, kind of have the vision and and show the d direction and uh, show the essential things that are are making difference. How can we ensure that we are maintaining our artistic energies and that they stay recharged? That's something that we have to always think about. We, we can't waste an opportunity to connect the audience to the, the music that we like and love. And that's, that's something that I think uh, many performers, they, they have to uh, maybe not struggle, but, but to, to kind of push themselves to innovate new things to okay now there's a thing I, I will do this better than last time uh, so many small things become very big things if you if you think of the progress of, of uh, interpretation and I sometimes when I'm walking in the forest and I suddenly think that oh why didn't I realize that before for me it was always like so and so but now now I know how, how to do it so so this is kind of a intuitive processes in, 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 in performance go, goes on all the time, kind of thinking about music and thinking of an interpretation or so. And that's from your perspective. I'm curious also about the perspective of an, of an audience. Did you ever have it happen that your audience reaction was completely unexpected, whether they found some humor in a piece or 
they didn't clap where they thought they were supposed to, or that you could feel some sort of energy in the hall that you said, where did that come from? Usually you are kind of 100% aware how the, how the things go, but sometimes, and it can be many things, maybe you haven't convinced the orchestra to, to give exactly the way, the, the kind of sound that you wanted. Maybe the hall doesn't produce enough and the, the, this kind of feeling of being remote from the, from the happening is in the audience. Uh, many things like that can affect that your own sensation is, is not, not uh, kind of uh, coming, coming back to you from, from the people. So, but then it can be also, in other ways, that you are not totally convinced that, okay, should I do this Nielsen 5 in here, in this place, and then suddenly the reaction is overwhelming, and you don't <laughs> know why, why in, 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 in that hall and with that audience it suddenly worked so well. But it's, it's some kind of mystery always. So with this show, many of our viewers are aspiring performers, they are conservatory students, and I'm thinking about the journey that they go through in trying to find their artistic path, but also the worries that they have in terms of career. I think that there might be some pressures to concern themselves with things that are outside of the music. Mm. I'm thinking about the fact that descriptions of your artistry often use the word um, sincerity. Is that something that can be uh, consciously followed? I mean, what is sincerity and, and how does that relate to any of the young musicians who might be watching this? For me, performing music is the most important thing in, in, my, in my life. And, and uh, the only reason to be, be a musician was that I wanted to do things in my way. I was sitting in orchestra playing second violin and, and then I felt that this and that conductor is doing this thing which doesn't really <laughs> convince me. So that was kind of, and of course many musicians have that same, same idea, okay, when I go there it's all will become fantastic. But it's, 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 a, it's a long way and of course you have to, you have to learn uh, not only the musical things, but also you have to learn your own identity. And it's to do and strengthen yourself with the things that you believe in yourself. So it's, it's no point trying to copy something, uh, an interpretation, without the kind of the motivation of, the, of the, the one that you are copying it from. I think you have to really find your specialities and, and, and the repertoire that you can uh, grow and, and convince the others. And I think this is the first uh, thing that I would say to a young, uh, young performer, that try to specify, try to think about what is, what is really good in you and, and, and what you can kind of bring, let's say, to an orchestra that you know exactly how you want it. And I sometimes, young conductors, they said that, well, if you got an opportunity to, uh, for the first time, to do a Brahms symphony in Vienna, should I do it? And absolutely not. Don't do it. Because, uh, well, unless you are extremely lucky. But, but, but I think those things, that you need to know what things could, could work in, in a circumstance, and, and also that you have to calculate. And of course, many, many people, including me, have made many mistakes in, in taking repertoire that it was not suitable for the, for the situation. And, and then you, you kind of learn a lot from that experience as well. Isn't that an essential part of the, the learning process to make mistakes? But did you feel like you had space to make mistakes? It, it seems like musicians would have to always get it right. And that must be a lot of pressure on stage. Yeah, most of the things you have to get right, but, but of course you are allowed to f few mistakes, but not too many. And that's, that's uh, how, how things are. Uh, so, uh, of course, I had a kind of privilege to, to do a lot of Finnish music like Sibelius and, and uh, also some contemporary things that uh, uh, 
it was like like my visit card to to orchestras, and of course that that was something that uh, worked really well for me. That I had uh, learned so much about that composer and 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 the style, and and I had so much kind of information from good mentors like uh, Pavo Berglund and uh, many others, my professor Jorma Panula. Uh, so, so I had something in the kind of my, in my pocket when I started, like like that. But then, of course, over the years, I, I started to develop uh, other things as well. Uh, I think most young musicians they kind of think the career is the main thing, and then they they are desperate to get it going somehow. And very often asked that how how to kind of establish your career, and and they said, well, it happens in so many ways. Some people they have to gradually build the thing up from doing small things, then it kind of grows and grows, and then suddenly you get an opportunity. And for some, it kind of happens immediately. You get like a jackpot, and then then it goes. But even that is very uh, kind of risky sometimes because if you get a jackpot, then you have to to use it, and then you, you have to grow immediately fast into into the profession. And it's sometimes very dangerous too. So I'm curious. Finally, what's inspiring you these days, musically or otherwise? I think that inspiring things are what I see in life. I mean, I'm uh, at the age that I, I can kind of uh, think back how the world was was uh, when I started, and 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 uh, kind of bring back those things that I learned. But also watching my four and a half year son is is like a such a joy to to see him grow and 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 how this new person learns about life and, and, and makes kind of ob observations. So I'm very lucky to have him. Then I, of course, I'm totally aware of what's happening in the world. That's, that's something that I'm, I'm following all the time. And I, I sometimes, as many of us, we, we get very, very depressed about, well, this interview is happening under under the COVID uh, times, that's something that nobody expected. But somehow you have to believe in this kind of uh, humanity and the, and, the, and the good luck of, of, of the population, that we, we find good leaders, we, have, we find solutions and, and um, enjoy small things, which, which of quality and, and nature and such things. So, so that's my recipe for, for, for kind of happiness. Mr. Sarasta, thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you about music and your life and life in general. Thank you.